what keeps you here now? In Los Angeles? Good question. Um, I love the city and I've been lucky enough that I came here, my brother lived here, but now pretty much my whole family has moved here. So now I have family here, so it's a little different. My sister's here, my younger sister, and my parents are in Palm Desert, so it's not far. So family, in a way, would keep me here no matter what. But I love Los Angeles. Um, it's such a sprawled out city. There's all these different pockets um, of cool things to do or hikes or whatever. So, and the weather is beautiful. So, you know, I don't try to promote it. <laughs> I, never, I never try to get more people to move here because so many people move here already. So. But a lot of people move back. Back home, yeah. A lot of people give up too and move away. But because of the weather, I feel like a lot of people move to Los Angeles in general. Sure. Um, but no, I, I, I'm in the mecca of movie making in the United States. I mean, that's where Los Angeles is. So I don't know what kind of trials and tribulations you'd have if you were in Atlanta or somewhere else. Maybe there, there's enough people that I wouldn't, you know, you have enough film people. But here, I mean, in my phone, I have 10 DPs I can call, directors of photography, who I can call and they own a camera. You know what I mean? So it's like, here, there's so many people that are making films. There's so many people that own cameras. It's really saturated. So to get a project off the ground, off the ground, it's a lot easier to get it off the ground. As to where, in middle of America, do you know anyone that owns a RED camera or Ari Alexa or any of these kind of cameras? It's probably really hard to find somebody that own one, owns one in like Nebraska or something. So here, you're in a bar, you're probably somebody in the bar probably owns a camera. I mean, it's just so, it's so saturated in that way, so. Well, hopefully they're sober enough to operate it, but yeah. Well, <laughs> they're not coming on set okay, like okay, that, good, but when good. you meet them, you right, never right, know. Right. So. Okay. But do you have a, a goal list? Like, do you have a certain amount of things that you know, by this date, I want to have them completed? I mean, I want to make 30 movies in my life, probably. Um, it's whatever inspires me, really. I mean, I have, in my phone, I have ideas for movies that go on and on. I mean, I must have 20 or 30 ideas for features. Um, some are fleshed out and some are really raw, just uh, one or two sentences. But I also have uh, a TV show like I did. So I came here and I worked for DreamWorks and I worked for Todd Phillips. And then I realized, it's funny because I realized the people around me had want to be directors or they want to be some position in film and they weren't doing it yet. And I was like, how long have you worked here? And oh, I've been doing this 11 years, but I want to be a film director. And I was like, so I could be you in 11 years? I was like, yeah, I gotta stop. So when I left Todd Phillips' office, I was like, I wanna act and direct. So I went to acting school and I started acting in um, every possible thing I could. I did 11 short films in 2009 and then I was a lead in three um, independent feature films in 2010. And when I saw the independent feature films, I realized they weren't good enough and I thought to myself, I have to get behind the camera if I really want to make my dreams come true. And I always planned on getting behind the camera anyway, eventually, but it just kind of pushed me to do it sooner. So I thought I was just going to produce an act. And so I put, I managed to raise the money together to shoot a TV pilot. Um, and I was going to produce, we had a director and everybody, the director pulled out and it was his script. So I told the money people, hold on, I'll write something else. Uh, and we can shoot that. So I ended up writing Three Guys in a Couch, uh, which is a TV pilot that I wrote and, and ended up directing because I couldn't find a director. Everybody couldn't see the vision that I had, so I ended up directing it too. So I acted and directed and wrote it. And we shot it in 2011. It's actually on Amazon Prime. You can go watch it on Amazon Prime. And uh, it's for free on there. And it's a 20-minute pilot. It's a comedy pilot. I kind of I loved Seinfeld growing up, and so it was kind of my newer version of Seinfeld, you know, um, my best version of it, I guess, that I could do. And it's just about three guys trying to rent out their couch for, to make rent. So, I mean, the whole episode is couch interviews. They're interviewing people to rent the couch. So that was the pilot episode, and I have, oh God, I have in my phone, like, 50 episodes of that show. I just kept writing ideas for that show and that show and show. So hopefully I do another show and, and use all those ideas eventually. But I did that TV pilot. It was the first thing I ever directed. Um, and then I ended up from that pilot, um, someone at Fox saw it and Fox called me in and was like, hey, 
it was a subsidiary of Fox, but it's on the Fox lot, called me and it was like, hey, we'd really like to develop a new show with you. Like, this was really good for your first thing. So let's, let's develop something else. So I came in every week for like eight or nine months, developing new ideas with them for new shows, and um, eventually settling on a show called Parole Officers, which is about a guy who gets arrested and he gets two parole officers um, that are going to help him change his life back around. But he, get f he, he got falsely arrested for drugs, so he really has no problem with drugs. And the two parole officers are completely crazy that, that take over his life and just totally destroy it even more. So we shot that in 2000. Well, hold on, rewind. Fox ended up scheduling it for me to do a table read. They were like, we're going to give you a million dollar budget to do the pilot, all this kind of stuff. And then they ended up pulling the plug. And so the day before the table read, they were like, we have something similar. Now we're not going to shoot this anymore. Oh, my goodness. Uh, what they did not know is every time I would come in with a script or an idea, well, not an idea, but a script, I was copywriting it. So I, are, I knew that I owned the copyright on the show. So, OK, you have something similar, but you're not going to steal my idea. So. I was like heartbroken for a while. I mean, it's hard to get over. It was eight or nine months, you know, of yeah. me telling my friends and everyone I'm doing a show with Fox. You know what I mean? So for me, it was like, it was very heartbroken when it didn't happen. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to shoot myself. So um, three guys on a couch we shot for five grand at the time on the red cameras. So this, I actually ended up shooting for five grand as well. It's a 27 minute pilot. It's also on Amazon Prime now, uh, parole officers. And so I ended up raising the money independently, and we shot that TV pilot as well in 2013. And then from there, um, there was I ended up directing two short films for Friends, and then it was like, it's time to do a feature. So that's when Wally Got Wasted got made. So I'm hoping we can go back to when you worked at Todd Phillips' office, and at what point did you have that, like, wow, I could be this person here or this person here, and they seem happy with their job, maybe not, maybe they are, but I don't want to have that be me. How did you, like, what, can you kind of take us through how long before you left after I that? think in the beginning, I think in the beginning it was just so exciting to be there. I mean, like, Angelina Jolie would come in the office, you know, like, Angelina Jolie was in the hallway, and I'm like, oh, there's a pretty girl in the hallway, and then she's standing out there for a while, I'm like, maybe this woman's lost, you know, I'll go out there. She was pregnant at the time. This pregnant woman's in the hallway, like maybe she's lost. So I went in the hallway, I'm like, hey, are you okay? Like, are you lost? And of course, once I get in the hallway, I'm like, oh, I'm talking to Angelina Jolie. Oh, that's cool. She's like, no, I'm just waiting. I'm about gonna go into a, a meeting upstairs and I just wanted a moment by myself. And I was like, okay, no problem. You know, I walked back in the office. She's right on the other side of the glass to me, you know, oh. and there's no one else around. So of course I'm like, oh, you know, Angelina Jolie's here on the computer, you know, telling the office. <laughs> um, and then like, the guy played Hellboy at the time, he was coming in the office like, and I met so many people coming in the office that were making movies and, and actors. And so in the beginning, it was just so exciting to be there. You know, on the post side of things, I never would meet movie stars or, I mean, I met Steven Spielberg and that, but I wouldn't meet like Angelina Jolie at DreamWorks at post-production, they just don't go there. But there it was just so exciting. I think it took a while for the excitement to wear off because I was doing script coverage on like three scripts a day they would expect three scripts a day for me to read and do coverage on them. And, and I'm a slow reader too, so it wasn't easy for me. But constantly trying to break it down and write a, you know, a one-page synopsis of the whole movie and, and green light it or not green light it. Like, if you didn't get through me, the people above me never read it. So that's how it would work. So if I don't like your script, the person above me doesn't like the script. It's not, I'm never going to read the script, you know. And then on top of that, which is kind of crazy to me in a way because these people have agents, they have managers, they have, but if you don't get through the guy at the front desk, you don't get to uh, Scott Budnick at the time or Todd Phillips or anyone else. So I'm literally like green lighting someone's life or not. But if I send it up the ladder and it's not good, my now I'm not considered a very good script coverage guy. So your own, my own ass is on the line. So it was very interesting at the time. I think it took three months before the excitement of it all, wore, all everything kind of wore off, and I started asking more questions, you know. And uh, Todd Phillips' assistant at the time was his assistant for like nine years, and I found out he was a film director, and I saw some commercials he shot and some other stuff, and he was like, yeah, I want to be a film director, and I was like, but you've been his assistant for nine years? Like, clearly he's not going to help you make a film, you know. 
Uh, so he's not going to help me make a film. I got to go make a film out on my own. So that's kind of the epiphany that I had that no one here, if you're not doing the job that you're supposed to be doing, they can't see. Like something I've learned in Hollywood since I've been here, people don't see potential. It's not something that they see. It's either you've done it or you haven't done it. It's very rare that someone can see potential of what you've done. Like uh, there's no excuses. It's like you've either made a phenomenal movie or you've made a mediocre movie and then they think you're going to always make a mediocre movie. So, or I guess in any position that you've done, they, can, they don't see potential like, oh, you had a really good moment here or there or your budget, you didn't have enough money. They don't see the excuses. It's either it's good enough or it's not. So. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because it's just everything goes too fast and there's too much money on the line? They don't have time to like nurture something or... I think it might have been different back in the day. They might have nurtured people more back in the day. I mean, like, all the studios now are, are corporate. I mean, like, Viacom, you know, like, all these big companies own the studios. It's not really owned by an individual anymore. Back in the day, Paramount, was it Paramount, I think, was owned by a guy that would go to all the premieres with a lion. I mean, it was one person's decision and a few people below him. And I think in the, what was it, the 90s or something? I mean, all the studios got bought up by big corporate companies, everything's powered by money. So since everything's powered by money, are you going to take a chance on someone who's already delivered or someone who has potential? I mean, if your ass is on the line, you're going to go with the safe bet. So part of me understands that. But I, I think also it takes a very special person to see potential. You know, I, I don't think everyone can see potential. It's about, it's, a, it's almost a rare skill compared to the talent. Like so, only some people are very, very talented. Some people only have that one gift of seeing talent too. Um, and half the people that I meet that are at the top, still, they don't have that gift. Like they shove 20, 40 million dollars in the advertising on a movie and the movie might bomb. Well, somebody else might have been able to see that it was going to bomb, but they couldn't see it. But they have the title of you know, the, the head of the studio or whatever. So it's just interesting to see how th certain things happen. And I know people in positions that tell me all kinds of stories where, you know, I'm like, really? I saw the trailer to that. I have no idea what that movie's about. And it's a two minute trailer. Like if I don't know what your movie's about at all and it's a two minute trailer, it's a really bad sign, <laughs> you know, and you're putting 40 million dollars in advertising. That blows my mind. But. Um, anyway.